I'm gonna show you guys 10 underrated PlayStation 5 games of 2021. These are my personal picks, so if you got a problem, then leave it in the comments below. Enjoy. Number 10. Wrecked Fest. Does anyone here remember a game called Destruction Derby? Wrecked Fest is sort of like that. It's a racing game developed by Bugbear Entertainment and has been described as the spiritual successor to the Flat Out series. The unique thing about Wrecked Fest is that it uses something called soft body modeling, which enables location-based damage. So depending on where a vehicle is hit, it can affect the driving dynamics in a realistic way. You shouldn't need to worry too much about that, however. I sure as hell didn't. Just know that the game is flat out fun. Standard races are your typical fare, but the inclusion of destructible vehicles provide a whole other dynamic. I never realized how much more is added to the driving experience when you can see your vehicle being ripped to shreds. It's something you don't see happen often in other racing games. Most of the time, you'll see a little dent here or there, but never to the level of destruction in Wreckfest. Motorstorm did it, but the driving was a little too floaty for me at times. Wreckfest makes it a little more realistic, but not to the point where a non-racing fan couldn't pick up the controller and start having fun. Those demolition mud pit events are fantastic. Having been released on the PS4, Wreckfest now gets the next-gen treatment with the most recent PS5 patch, offering a few graphical improvements such as dynamic dirt, new visual effects for skid marks, more foliage, shadows, environmental, as well as volumetric lighting. Bumped up to 4K resolution, running at 60 FPS, this is one upgrade that's worth getting. Not only that, but haptic feedback has been added to the DualSense as well as a 24 online multiplayer mode. I think you know what you need to do next. Number 9. Maneater. An action role-playing game where you play as a female bull shark who must take revenge on a fisherman for killing your mother. Now there's a game you don't hear about quite often. Played from a third-person perspective. Think Echo the Dolphin on Sega Dreamcast. You swim around consuming other aquatic wildlife to gain nutrients so you can unlock other abilities, which in turn will allow you to get bigger and take on stronger, deadlier creatures. It's not very complicated, and quite frankly, I'd rather keep it like that. Underwater games should not be complicated, which is why Man Eater is so much fun. I was really amazed at how easy it was just to pick up and play. It's a very arcadey style of gameplay. As I mentioned earlier, you play as a shark, and you basically swim around eating other sea life and human that are in your way. Occasionally, you get hunters on boats who try to take you out, so it's your job to take care of them as well. This game would have probably sold more if it had just been called Jaws. What I also like about this game is how well it captures the essence of being a shark. As IGN would say, it really does make you feel like a shark. Is that what they say? The graphics are gorgeous and shows an abundance of underwater wildlife. Everything from the coral reefs to giant sea turtles make an appearance. It's actually quite relaxing. And if you took away all the hunters trying to kill you, the game can be therapeutic at times. If you were a fan of Echo the Dolphin, you may want to consider Maneater. You might not be saving the world, but the underwater view does bring back memories of Sega's classic franchise. Number 8. Puyo Puyo Tetris 2. Let's just be clear about one thing. This isn't Grand Theft Auto. You're not going to be stealing cars or killing hookers. Objects fall from the sky and you're basically either matching up the colors or filling in the lines. I mean, do I really need to explain this? Maybe the Puyo Puyo part. I can see where some people would be confused. With Puyo Puyo, you're matching up four or more of the same colors. It's actually very similar to Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo. Except this time you're controlling colored blobs instead of gems. Puyo Puyo Tetris 2 is a sequel to the original Puyo Puyo Tetris. Boy, I said Puyo quite a lot there. Part 2 introduces a new story campaign and 4-player online multiplayer. In addition, you also get all offline modes from the original game, as well as skill battle mode with gameplay changing effects. There's also a local multiplayer. I never thought I'd see that in a video game ever again. The game's quite colorful and charming, I'd have to say. Almost anime-ish. Is that even a word? The gameplay is simple to understand, but can get pretty intricate when you start understanding how to pull off combos. I guess the game can be whatever you put into it, really. Not necessarily next-gen stuff, but a nice game to play when you need a break from everything else. Oh, and by the way, did I mention it was developed by Sonic Team? Yeah, remember those guys? Number 7. The Pathless. Man, this game is so underrated, it falls into the category of hidden gem. Did you hear that, Metal Jesus? What a surprise this game turned out to be. I hadn't watched any reviews on it, so I didn't really know what to expect. It's a cross between Journey and maybe a tiny sprinkling of Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. The Pathless is a third-person action-adventure game where you play as a master archer named The Hunter, who must find a way to lift the curse on an island. At first, you'd think The Pathless was exactly what it sounded like, a game that basically had no path where you left to figure things out on your own. That's how I felt for the first few minutes, but the good thing is that the game always managed 
manages to push you in the right general direction. Eventually, you soon discover Spirit Vision, a move that shows you hidden paths and locations of interest. My advice, just go towards the red towers and you'll be fine. There's no on-screen map, but luckily, I don't think you really need it. There's exploration that can be done, but I couldn't help but just have the urge to just speed through the entire stage. Just running from one area to the next feels like a game in itself. You recharge your run meter by shooting arrows at floating talismans scattered throughout the level. Each successful hit recharges your meter and gives you a slight speed boost. With so many talismans scattered around, it starts to become apparent that this is what you'll be using to speed travel around the open world. It's a lot easier than it sounds. There's an auto-targeting system, so don't worry. When you're not running around, you'll be exploring the beautiful open world solving puzzles and collecting crystals which you can use to upgrade your eagle abilities that's right you get an eagle that follows you and allows you to glide and float around check this out isn't it cool how you can pet your eagle as you journey through the land and try to lift the curse you occasionally come across a boss fight these are always cool to look at the pathless is simple but fun the little bits of lore that's dropped behind by dying citizens make the world of the pathless that much more engaging if there were just a few more characters to interact with and side quests to do this could have been a triple a title number six terminator resistance enhanced i'm a huge fan of the franchise so you can imagine my excitement going into this my last experience with a terminator game didn't go so well but nevertheless i still had high hopes is it any good yes Depending on who you ask, casual gamers and non-fans will completely despise it, while fans of the movies will absolutely eat it up. Uninspired gameplay, stupid enemy AI, and boring mission objectives are usually what you'll hear. The game doesn't do anything you haven't seen in other first-person shooters that's come before it. Well, at least in terms of gameplay. You can also pick up raw materials scattered throughout the levels to make ammo and health items. All things you've seen already in other games. The gunplay isn't anything special either. To be honest, it's pretty mediocre. The graphics are slightly above average, but at least the frame rate remains consistent at 60 FPS. With that being said, why is this game even on the list? Well, like I said earlier, if you like the Terminator movies, you'll absolutely love Resistance. I might go so far as to say this could even be a love letter to fans of the franchise. The world building captures the mood and tone of the Terminator films so perfectly. You think Resistance was a sequel to T2 even. I don't really count the third film. As you wander the environment and scavenge for supplies, you actually buy into the fact that Judgment Day did indeed happen. Dilapidated buildings and war-torn landscapes captures the nightmare the Resistance tried so hard to prevent. And the soundtrack totally brings everything together. Nice. My only complaint is that maybe they could have thrown in a few more T-800 models in there for you to fight, as the enemy variety can get a little tedious. Critics might hate it, but fans will absolutely eat it up. A future cult favorite. Number 5. Neptunia Reverse. Listen, I gotta tell you guys something. This might come as a shock, but the thing is, I've never played a Neptunia game until now. I mean, I've heard of it and I know there's a huge following, but I was just never interested enough to actually sit down and play it for myself. I guess it was always the name that turned me off. It just sounded so weird to me. Like, Hyper Dimension Neptunia? I'm just like, what? For those who don't know, Reverse is an enhanced version of Hyper Dimension Neptunia Rebirth 1, which was originally released on the PlayStation Vita. Hey, remember that thing? New features include an increase in party size from 3 to 4 members, an arranged mode which allows you to pick from 20 characters to use from the very beginning, a new tutorial mode as well as a new fishing minigame. Of course, all this means nothing to me as I've never played the original. So what do I think of it? To be honest, I actually really like it. The gameplay reminds me of Eternal Sonata on the Xbox 360. No wait, was it Blue Dragon? I can't remember. It's one of those. There's a cool combo system you can perform as well as a Sailor Moon transformation type thing going on. I'm sorry, I don't know what it's called. Someone help me out here. What really impressed me the most was the story. I mean, talk about breaking down the fourth wall. I'm not even going to attempt to explain it. Something about CPUs and hard disk drives. I'm pretty sure someone in the comments can explain it. Reverse isn't the greatest looking PS5 game, but it does have its moments. The graphics are colorful and the hand-drawn artwork looks awesome on the big screen. The English voiceovers are pretty good as well. Worthy enough for me to choose it over the Japanese track if there ever was an anime. The turn-based battle isn't really anything new or groundbreaking, but the story does keep you playing. It's just that good. I I can't say I'd recommend this to people who have already played this on last gen consoles, but for newcomers who've never heard of the name before, this is definitely worth picking up. Number 4. Spirit of the North Enhanced Edition 
Okay, first off, I'd just like to remind everyone this is not Call of Duty, so know that going into this game. It's a third-person action game that was inspired by the beautiful landscapes of Iceland. The neat thing about Spirit of the North is that there isn't any dialogue or narrative. The game turns on and you basically just start playing. It can be a little annoying at first since there isn't really any kind of objective. You control a fox wandering the land and eventually you receive supernatural powers from the spirit of another fox. I know, just bear with me for a moment. The land is tainted with red corruption and it's your job to expel it. Nothing too complicated. The game consists mainly of you walking and the occasional platforming. Not a very intense game. It's actually quite the opposite. This is a good game for when you're stressed out. It's slow, it's calming, the visuals are beautiful, and the music can put you to sleep. I mean that in a good way, really. It's a different kind of game. The one where you sit back and just observe the little bits that's given to you and try your best to make out what everything means. I actually really enjoy games like that. You have to read the environment and try to interpret what everything means. I think nowadays there are way too many games where everything is just spoon fed to you. Go here, do this, pick up this item, talk to this person. It's a breath of fresh air to just be able to play a game and not have a million directions thrown at you. But hey, that's just me. If you're in the mood for some sightseeing or need a break from Call of Duty, then check out Spirit of the North. You might like it. Number three, Maquette. Did I say that right? Maquette is a puzzle adventure game that has you solving environmental puzzles in a first person perspective. The unique thing, however, is that the puzzles you interact with is basically an exact replica of the actual space you're in. It's almost like looking at yourself in another dimension. Kind of cool, I guess. Graphically, the game looks amazing, but I did notice a few frame rate stutters here and there, more often than I like to admit. Normally, I'd freak out over a dropped frame, but this isn't exactly the kind of game that requires pinpoint accuracy. The audio is equally amazing. Brilliant use of music and well-casted voiceovers really bring this game to life. This is one of those calming games where you sit back and let it all sink in. The puzzles aren't that complicated either. It'll take you a few minutes to walk around and get accustomed to the area, but once you do, it's pretty easy. More important than the puzzles is a story, however, which I think is amazing. It's one of those stories that pulls at your heartstrings and makes you think about life in general. It's a story about a relationship that didn't exactly work out and the process the character goes through in order to find closure. As you walk through the levels, you find little memories here and there about the two characters and how they met and why things didn't work out. I think every one of us can relate to this one way or another. It's heartwarming and a little sad to be honest. Uh, take my advice guys. Don't ever fall in love. Number 2. Legends of Talia Arcadia now, the only reason this game is on the list is because it has to be the easiest platinum trophy I've ever come across. Simply go into preference where it says skip at the very top. You want to check off unseen text, after choices, and transitions. For attack speed, you want to make sure it's set to fastest as well as auto forward time. Then you want to go back to the main menu and start your game. Once the game starts, press R1 on the controller and just sit back and wait for that beautiful platinum. It shouldn't take more than a minute. I just sped up the footage so you guys can see the platinum trophy. And there you have it. The game is also cross by so you can go back and do it on the PS4 version as well. Don't ask me what the game is about. I have no idea. Number one, Dirt 5. I know, I know, I'm sorry. But I actually like the more arcade style approach Codemasters took with this one. Sometimes I just need a quick pick up and play kind of racer. And that's exactly what Dirt 5 is. The racing for the most part generally feel pretty solid. It's not so arcadey that you won't need skill to complete an event. Yet not so complicated where you'll need to know the intricacies of a car in order to handle it. Each vehicle feels unique yet easy to grasp. It's a fine line I think Codemasters captured very well. The addition of adaptive triggers also heighten the experience as you can feel the tension of the gas and brake pedal on each finger. The game isn't going to break any new ground, but it's a tried and true formula that works. At least for me it did. Career mode isn't convoluted. Races are displayed on an easy to understand menu screen. There's even a story presented to you through a series of in-game podcasts before each race. They're interesting and pretty funny sometimes. They add more to the career mode than you think. There's also little side objectives that you can choose to do if you want during a race. The music is catchy and the graphics are gorgeous. I'm talking about the real-time weather effects, day and night transitions, and track deformations. Put that all together and you have one of the prettiest driving games out there. It's just so cool to race on a track and have it literally change before your eyes after each lap. 
My favorite is the China level with all the puddles and the green vegetation. Snow and ice stages look amazing as well. The New York bridge with snow and fireworks going off in the background looks phenomenal. The game runs in 60 FPS, but I did notice a few instances where the frame rate would drop considerably, especially when you're using image quality mode. It happens, but never at crucial moments in the game and not enough for me to choose the alternative. If you want a more stable frame rate, choose the resolution option. Honestly, I went with image quality as I want all the pretty graphical effects in addition to the 60 fps that's also online play which i tried for a few minutes it works and there's people on there i guess if you're looking for a rally simulation racer then dirt 5 is definitely not it if you want a fun easy to pick up and play with a little challenge racing game and beautiful graphics then dirt 5 is the game for you now if you want to see more games worth playing on the ps5 then click the links on the screen or the ones that are pinned down below thank you so much for watching i'll see you next time